Hi, my name's Warren North and welcome back to Tennis Backwards. In this chapter we're going to talk about the slice backhand, which is my favourite shot in tennis. And the reason why is, is because it's, it's just so subtle and so nuanced. So, look, I remember lots of my tennis games where I'll play a slice backhand and, and it sort of lands in three-quarter court and you're playing somebody who's got a really big forehand and every time it just runs around it and hits a winner. But there was a really interesting match last year where Dan Evans beat Novak Djokovic at uh, Monte Carlo. And I don't know if you remember that game, but, but after it, um, Novak said something like that Dan had dismantled his game. And if you've, if you've seen that game, that's exactly what happened. And the shot that, that really did the damage was the slice backhand, because like Dan's probably got the best slice backhand in, in, on the planet. So what is it about the slice backhand that can be a, go from being a plonker at club stand at tennis yet to being a shot that can dismantle the game of the number one player in the world? Well, the answers, as I said, are really subtle, they're really nuanced and really interest, interesting. And it goes right to the heart of, of what we've talked about today, which is the science of tennis, of a tennis ball, its flight and its bounce. So let's just quickly recap on these three scientific um, principles or theories, if, if you like, that we have of ball flight and ball bounce. So the first one is the aerodynamic effect. And what that tells us is that a spinning ball has a force exerted on it by the air, which is at right angles to its axis of spin. The next one is the bicycle effect. And what that tells us is that a spinning ball travels such that it's constrained within its plane of spin, but within that plane, it has a high variability with respect to its, its ball properties. And the final um, theory we have, which is the coefficient of friction. And from that, we know that we have both a dynamic and a static coefficient, and they can be quite different. And that the, the way a ball spins can have a big effect on which, um, which coefficient applies and how they interplay with each other. So let's get started, the slice backhand. So the first point to make is that there's actually two distinct slice backhands. One is what I recall the um, recovery shot and the other one is the ball and play. So um, I'm sure you can probably understand what I mean by that in terms of tennis strokes. I'm, I'm more interested in the science of it. So there's a key difference between these two shots and, and to understand that difference we need to go back to the aerodynamic effect on the ball. So if we do a slice ball, if, as we know, that the, from the moment you hit it, it's the gravity's down but the aerodynamic force is up so the ball travels in a pretty straight line but because you've got the aerodynamic effect and the gravity working against each other, the ball um, loses energy quite quickly so it starts to slow down, starts to drop and then it reaches a critical point where it essentially runs out of energy and stalls and falls to the ground. And that last bit, that's, that's the key. So the key difference is, is that the recovery shot bounces after the ball stalls and the ball in play bounces before it stalls. So let's start with the slice bank and recovery shot, which is the easier of the two in terms of the, the, the science of the shot. So it's exactly what it sounds like. It's if your opponent plays a good shot or if you're out of position. It can even be a forehand. You'll see a lot of the players are hit with almost like a squash forehand when they're out of position. I mean, it's, it's, it's essentially the same shot. So what is the one thing about a good recovery shot? And, and that is that it, it needs to land deep. But if we now go back to our scientific principles, particularly the bicycle principle, it tells us that this ball that's spinning, it travels such that it's constrained within its plane of spin, but within that plane, it has a high variability with respect to its, its position and properties. So if you think about that, there's something wrong. Like, I mean, it, it, that's exactly what we don't want. But, and, and this is a big but, if you hit lots of balls, slice balls, albeit they have a variability of their, of their position within their plane of spin, they, the process we talked about of stalling, those balls, they effectively run out of energy and stall at about the same time. In other words, the spin 
gauges the depth and that's exactly what we're trying to, trying to achieve. So another way of saying that the slice backhand recovery shot we use the spin of the ball and we use the fact that the ball is going to stall to gauge the depth so that we can hit a deep shot. So now let's talk about the, the slice backhand ball and play. And if you remember what we um, figured out with this shot, the key thing about it is that it bounces before the ball stalls. So if you're going to do that, what's the most important thing about the shot? And the most important thing is that it's got to go low over the net. So if we go back to our scientific theories, particularly the bicycle principle, which says that the ball has a high variability of its position within its plane of spin. So for a conventional slice, that's the plane of spin. So it has a high variability of its position that way. Well, if you think about it, that's not going to work. So the secret here is that we need to rotate the plane of spin. So that's the conventional slice that way. What we're going to do initially, we're going to rotate it 90 degrees. And, and I tell you what, you can, you can test this by yourself. If you, that, that the good way is just to go to a volley board and stand sort of maybe sort of, I don't know, 10 feet away, so sort of three meters away, and then hit the ball with 100% side spin so that you're just trying to consistently get the ball to hit that line on the volleyboard which, which represents the top of the net. And you'll, you'll find that it works. Um, it's, it's much easier by spinning this ball to consistently um, get the ball to hit that, that, that line on the volleyboard. Now double the distance back, so go back sort of, I don't know, sort of 25 feet or whatever back do the same thing and you'll, you'll notice like it doesn't work anymore. And the reason why is because this, the going back to the bicycle principle, the second part of it about the variability of the ball or its position within that plane of spin, what's happening is gravity is now starting to have an effect. So as the balls have a variable position, gravity has a variable effect. So it no longer works. So the secret now is we started with that, we went to that. The secret now is to spin the ball at an angle of, a, so the axis of spin is around about 45 degrees. And if you do that, you'll suddenly find that, that just everything works, like the, the planets align or whatever. Because now we've got, so the ball spun that way, so we've got a component of, of spin which is that way which means that we have the aerodynamic effect, which means the ball basically travels straight until it gets to the net. And then we have a component of the spin, so we're spinning that we have a component of the spin that way, which means we get the advantages of the bicycle effect, whereby the, the ball is constrained to, to the plane of spin, which is that way, which is what we want to do to try and get it to go low over the net. Once we hit a shot the way we've just described, the possibilities just open up because because everything about the shot works. So for instance, the first thing is we're hitting it low to the net. So that means we can hit it with a reasonable amount of speed because, because we know that it's not going to go out. The second thing is we, we hit it with a lot of spin. And remember, a component of that spin is side spin. So that means the ball's going to track sideways, which, which means it, it's going to make it harder for your opponent to, to run the ball down and to set themselves up to, to hit a, to hit a, a shot in, in, in reply. And the final thing is, is the bounce of the ball. And, the, and this is a critical thing really. So the first thing is the ball, remember it's got a quite a low trajectory. So the ball's going to bounce low. And, and we, know, we know that people with big loopy topspin forehands don't like a low bounce. But remember too, we've got the two types of bounce. So if we and we've got the one that's governed by the static coefficient and one that's governed by the dynamic coefficient. So if we go back to our what we've already covered, which was the theory of the coefficient of friction. So a, if a ball bounces and it's the static coefficient, it means that it's you're going to have a pretty normal bounce, albeit a low bounce. But if it's dynamic, it means the ball's going to skid. And the final thing to throw into this is, I, like I know we're hitting the balls um, that we designing it so that it doesn't stall, but the ball might still stall. 
So if you think about that, we've got three components there. We've got a ball that, and with a normal bounce to the static coefficient, we've got a ball that skids to the dynamic coefficient, and then we've got a ball that stalls. And it's not too as if all of those are black and white. It's not as if, you know, a ball just either stalls or it doesn't. I mean, it, there can be a combination of those things, three things. So for instance, you could conceivably hit a ball that would be on the cusp of stalling that would start to skid and then grip. And, and think about it too, if you, I think if you go back, I mentioned that game um, right at the start of this chapter, the, um, Dan Evans when he beat Novak Djokovic. If you go back and if you, if you watch that game, I think that's exactly what happened. Because Dan was hitting a lot of slice backhands, he was hitting them cross court, and it was like that day, just like he had the ball on a string. And they were doing all those three things. I mean, a lot of them were just on the cusp of, of stalling. Some of them would stall, some of them wouldn't. And some of them might partially stall, and then some of the balls were bouncing up and some of them were skidding. And as we said, it dismantled the game of the number one player in the world. So just imagine what you can do with a shot. So that's the science of the slice back and now let's actually hit one. And this is one of the reasons why I love the shot so much because it is such an easy shot to hit. And the reason why is because we don't need to generate huge amounts of racket head speed. So it's a sort of shot that you can hit all day long. It's not gonna give you tennis elbow. And, and really you should never miss. So let's start. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the three components of, that we were interested in before and we've done chapters on before, which are the ball, the racket and the arm. And we just go through them one by one and we start with the ball. So this is a ball where I put a pin through and one that yeah, I've rescued from my dog. Um, so I put a pin through there and the pin defines the axis of spin, which is the key thing that we're interested in, the, it, which is the axis of spin. So for the recovery shot, that's the axis of spin. And for the ball and play, that's the axis of spin. If you remember, we rotated about 45 degrees. And now the racket, if you remember when, when we looked at the racket, the racket has, there's a component to the racket that corresponds with each of the ball components. And the one that corresponds with the direction of the axis of spin is the direction of the racket um, that generates a spin. So there's the axis of spin. So what I've got, you can see I've got the racket face is parallel to that axis and it's moving that way. Whereas if I rotate 45 degrees for the, um, for this, for the ball and play, you can see the racket rotates the same amount to generate the spin that we want for that shot. And the final one <clears throat> is the arm. So if you remember with the arm, um, in theory, every joint has three degrees of movement, but, but what we did is we, we went through all the, the joints. So we went through the, um, the wrist, the elbow, the shoulder, and the final one, which is the body, which had six degrees of movement. And what we did is we got rid of some of them and then we combined some of them and we ended up with essentially five degrees of movement that are relevant and that we're interested in. And that was the wrist, the elbow, the arm swinging, the arm rotating, and finally the body rotating. Now for the topspin forehand, we used all of them because we wanted to, because we wanted to generate the maximum racket head speed. But, but for the slice backhand, we don't need that amount of racket head speed, which means we can simplify the shot, we can make it easier to hit and, and more consistent. So let me hit a slice backhand. That's it there. And now let's run through all of those five components one by one. So the first one is the wrist. Now as you can see, I've locked my wrist. So it's not doing anything at all. The next one is the elbow. So the elbow, it's full movement is about that. But all I'm using is just a small amount of it. So I'm starting with my elbow cocked about that and I'm just straightening it in the shot. The next one is the arm swing. As you can see, I'm swinging my arm. Next one is arm rotation. 
Now, if you remember with the topspin four, and that, that was a biggie, that generated most of the racket head speed. But for the slice backhand, as I said before, we, we don't need so much racket head speed, so we don't need arm rotation. So the arms, arm rotation is essentially locked for this shot. And the final one is body rotation. As you can see, there's just only just a small amount of body rotation. So that's how you hit a slice backhand. So, and now the last thing to go over is just the difference between the, um, the, the two backhand shots. So we've got the recovery and the ball of play. And essentially they're the, the same shot. All that happens really is that for the ball and play, you just hit with a slightly more open stance. So what I mean by that is, is so if I'm hitting a ball towards the camera, my opponent's that way, that's the recovery shot and I rotate, you see I've rotated my body about 45 degrees, and that's the ball in play. So that's the slice backhand. Thank you for watching that, and now we're gonna move on to the next chapter, which is gonna be about hitting with side spin.